If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to turn with me to the book of 2 Kings. We'll be around about the chapters 15 to 23. And just as a disclaimer, Robin and I did not collude this morning. That was a Holy Spirit thing. So thank you so much, Robin, and thank you to the Lord uh, as we share a story. I'd like you to come with me in your mind's eye, in your imagination, to a true place and a true time about 2,500 years ago. But don't let the distance and time think that you are a stranger to this scene. King Esarhaddon was a very angry man. His rise to power had not gone smoothly. As the youngest son of the king, he was not the likely choice for a successor. According to the records, he was the preferred son of his father and hinted that perhaps one day he would be king of Nineveh. But not just the king of Nineveh, the king of the four winds, the king of the world. One day, Esarhaddon's father had gone to war. You'll recognize his father's name, but we'll keep it a secret for just a few minutes. His father going to war had not gone very successfully. In a tremendous, unlikely turn of events, Esarhaddon's dad had lost almost his entire army. Everybody in Nineveh had been whispering. To lose a war like this was unconscionable. It must be that the gods Bel and Ashur were very displeased. How else could you describe such a catastrophic loss unless you had displeased the gods? the gods of the great Nineveh. The only way to fix this problem would be to execute the king. And this is what had happened. Esarhaddon's own brothers had gone into the temple when their father was worshipping and executed him for the dignity of their city, for the dignity of the four winds for the dignity of the earth. I'll see if I can show you a picture. I don't know if it's on the screen behind me. No, it's going to be coming up in a minute. There'll be a couple of... Um, Josh has told me to push the button. There's a picture. By the way, all the pictures this morning uh, are going to be authentic. This is actually a, a, a carving that um, Esa Hardin commissioned of himself. So there you have it. Despite all of this uneasiness in the kingdom of Nineveh, Esarhaddon was convinced that the gods were with him. He was the rightful heir to the throne. Had not the gods Ashur, Bel, Shin come to his aid previously? Had they not promised that he would become the new ruler of Nineveh? These are some of his uh, lamasu, some of his guardian, protective, protective, protective gods that uh, guarded the palace. As soon as this uneasiness crept through Nineveh, Esarhaddon moved very fast. He felt that his brothers, although trying to do an honourable thing, had overstepped by executing his own dad. So he chased them to a land far away. All of his family left. Esarhaddon seized power and took control of the city. And there are several inscriptions we have to this day that help us to remember, in case anybody could forget, who the great Esarhaddon was. Let me read to you an English translation of one of his inscriptions. Esarhaddon, great king, legitimate king, king of the world, 
king of Assyria, regent of Babylon, king of Sumer and Arkad, king of the four rims of the earth, the true shepherd, the favorite of the great gods. Esarhaddon was now used to getting his way. Whatever he wanted, it happened. How many kings had flung themselves at his feet, willing to kiss his toes? Was it 19? Was it 20 kings? Was it 21? Well, the most recent inscription said 22, but that was last autumn, so it's probably gone up since then. No one had dared to question the great Esarhaddon. They wouldn't dare. Would you? Would you stick your neck out for King Esarhaddon? Do you know what he does to people who questions him? But there was somebody who had decided that they would dare question King Esarhaddon, the great king, the legitimate king of Assyria. Some little peon king in Judah had decided to go back on a treaty. Esarhaddon knew him very well. In fact, Esarhaddon's own grandmother had come from there. This king had been paying tribute to Esarhaddon. Esarhaddon was building great monuments and edifices to himself and he needed an income to pay for his building processes. This king had been a very good and loyal payer of this tribute, but all of a sudden the money stopped. Esarhaddon wanted to make things even. How dare this little king refuse a simple request of the great king Esarhaddon, king of Nineveh, king of Assyria, king of the four rims, king of the world. What nerve. Now, we're going to go backwards and forwards for a couple of kings because the focus this morning is going to be on the people of Nineveh. We've heard the story of Jonah going to Nineveh. We've heard of King Esarhaddon, king of Nineveh. But there's a few more stories. We're going to bring them together. And at the end of our stories today, the question is going to be, what kind of a God is it that rules over Nineveh? What kind of a God is it that rules over us and our hearts? Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, as we jump into the Bible this morning, we recognize our inadequacy. There is nothing that we can do. I don't have the confidence like King Esarhaddon. I sense that without your help, I can do nothing. And perhaps for some of us here today, we are in that boat too. Lord, some of us take turns feeling like we have it all together. And I pray that you'd speak gently to us this morning as you spoke to each of these rulers, each of these kings, each of these queens, and each of these subjects that we consider this morning. May our hearts be on you as our earnest prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'd like to just rewind the clock back from King Esarhaddon and a couple of generations and introduce to you a little bit of a, a family lineage. I'm not so sure about the family part because when it comes to Assyrian kings, it doesn't so matter, matter so much who you're born to, but who you claim you were born to. <laughs> so we don't know fully who was the child of who because sometimes people jumped into the queue and said, hang on a minute, I'm the new king, I'm the son of so-and-so, and now I'm boss. So with that disclaimer in mind, let's look at the, um, uh, the, the second predecessor to, um, to a few generations back before Esarhaddon. Let me first introduce you to the, to the king who was named after Ellen White's dog, Tiglath Pileser III. Tiglath Pileser III was a very um, interesting dog and also happens to be the name of an Assyrian king 
that was several generations before Essa Hardin. Tiglath Pileser was also a very confident man. He knew a thing or two about how to rule the world. And if you happen to have an interest, this is his uh, graffiti, if you want to call it that, uh, on a stele, reciting all of the great achievements that he had done. He conquered whoever got in his way, and in fact the Bible tells us that the Lord even used tiglath Pileser to help the people of God reconsider their particular path. But for the sake of children this morning, the details are probably not appropriate to get into, but I can assure you that the most explicit R-rated movies today have nothing over what these guys used to do uh, in multiple domains. It just so happens that uh, I have an English translation of the Stiele that this gentleman, if you want to call him that, um, Tiglath Pileser III, wrote about himself in stone. After reciting all of the nations that he had conquered, all of the queens he had taken prisoner, all of the subjects that were now his servants, all of those who had kissed his toes, he then writes this at the bottom. This is his postscript at the bottom of the Stiele. I cause this Stiele, you can see here, to be made in the vicinity of this mountain, and I depict on it the symbols of the great gods my gods, and I engraved upon it my own royal image. Can you see the royal image? There it is. And the mighty deeds of Ashur, my God, the achievements of my hands, which were done throughout all the lands. I wrote this myself, he says. I did it. Is not this the great Assyria that I have built with my own hands for my own honor and glory? Can you guess who his queen was? You probably haven't had a chance to look at this recently. It might shock you to find out who his queen was. I'll leave you hanging for a couple more minutes and then I'll tell you. Let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 16. Second Kings chapter 16. In 2 Kings chapter 16, this is writing from the perspective of Israel, or Judah more precisely. This is God's, supposedly God's chosen people. They're really messed up. Terrible things are happening, even to the point of human sacrifices. And so as a result of these terrible bad choices of the people of Israel, God allows some hardship to come from the north, from the Syrians, Damascus, not to be confused with Nineveh, different people, different place. The Syrians came and gave Judah a hard time, so much so that in chapter 16, we see there the king Ahaz asks for help. Who does king Ahaz of Judah go to to ask for help? This man right here, Tiglath Pileser, happy to help. Why? Because Tiglath Pileser was married. The, the main head queen of Assyria, Tiglath Pileser's wife, was Jewish. So, when the Jews came to Tiglath Pileser for help, he was happy to help, for, with a few small strings attached. Let's read together chapter 16, verse 10. This is 2 Kings 16, verse 10. When King Ahaz went to Damascus, this is the people who had just been attacking him, but now he was going there to meet his mate, who had uh, more power. He went to Damascus to meet Tiglath Pileser, this man right here, king of Assyria. He saw the altar that was at Damascus, and King Ahaz sent to Uriah the priest a model of the altar and its pattern exact in all its details. So when King Ahaz of Judah met with this great king, Tiglath Pileser. He complied with the requirements of the treaty, paid money, copied his altar, 
And then look at verse uh, 18, I think it is. Verse 17 and verse 18. King Ahaz ordered the, the, the architecture back in Jerusalem to be desecrated to make the king of Assyria, this king, happy. Verse 17. 2 Kings 16, verse 17. King Ahaz cut off the frames of the stands, removed the basin. This is in Jerusalem. He took down the sea, that's the big laver, from off the bronze oxen that were under it and put it on a stone pedestal and covered the way and the covered way for the Sabbath that had been built inside the house and the outer entrance for the king. He caused to go around the house of the Lord because of the king of Assyria. I won't share any more details, mums and dads, adults, feel free to read in context. There's a lot of messy stuff in there. But this king Ahaz was happy to mortgage his soul, literally, to satisfy this king, get him back up and defeat his enemies. Keeping in mind, Tiglath Pileser's wife was Jewish. His wife's name was Yeba, and this is an inscription from Yeba's tomb. There were, there were four tombs where very high quality, very well-off people were buried. This is the only tomb from antiquity that was not robbed. This tomb was found intact with two people buried there, both of them ladies, both of them very well-off, both of them queens, both of them in Nineveh and both of them Jewish. Let that sink in. I haven't had a chance to translate this tablet yet, but I think it is a warning, it's a curse that says, if anybody robs this tomb, you'll be cursed by the gods. I think that's what this tablet says. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. I'm not that good with um, cuneiform, I'm sorry. This is the place where Tiglath Pileser's wife was buried. But let's just fast forward to the next uh, king, two generations later, about seven years later. Let me now introduce you to Sargon II. He also follows in the style of Tiglath Pileser. And the story of Sargon is in 2 Kings chapter 15 and 2 Kings chapter 16. I have a picture for you of, this is an artist's representation because the actual palace has been destroyed, but the archaeologists are digging it up and we're reconstructing what we believe it looked like. Sargon built a beautiful, um, it's like a, almost a, a, a small town outside the outskirts of Nineveh just for himself and for his queen. <laughs> and this is some of the gardens um, that was kept in there. Guess who his queen's uh, name was. And guess where she came from? Any guesses? She was Jewish. She was, and we're not quite sure exactly how she came to Nineveh. Um, there's a few different theories out there. But this is the other queen that was buried with um, Tiglath Pileser's queen. They were both uh, buried in honor, with dignity, with great wealth, and not even to this day were the tomb robbers able to find it and pilfer it. Before Sargon passed away, in fact, one year before he came to grief, Sargon, the great king of Assyria, made this inscription for himself, 360 kilometers southeast of Nineveh, on a campaign. 40 meters up a cliff, there's nothing to hang on to, it's just a sheer rock face cliff. 40 meters up, into the rock, 1.7 meters high, 1.5 meters uh, wide. I'm not quite sure how deep it is that you can kind of see, but this is an inscription and a, um, a monument carved out of solid rock to the great Sargon II. I don't know if you can see in the middle of that archway, a bit of a, it's a bit faded there, but you can see a bit of an outline of a person, a king, the great tall um, crown that the Syrian kings wore. I'll see if I can show you a better picture of that. 
Um, is it going to transition for me? Is it gonna, yeah, it's a bit hard to see there. See that shape there? That's, um, that's the um, outline of the king. It's a bit hard to see. I don't know if you can also make out there, but in the background, written all over the whole archway, is another inscription. Once again, this inscription details great um, exploits and accomplishments. And he concludes with this. Sargon, great king, mighty king, king of the world, king of Assyria, governor of Babylon, king of the land of Sumer and Akkad, favorite of the great gods, he says, the perfect hero, a strong man, a pious prince, a marvelous man, the shepherd of his people. Imagine reading something about yourself written in that kind of language today. Wouldn't that be kind of uplifting? Hey, people think I'm pretty great. Sargon had this inscribed in rock so that people would remember who he was. And one year later, he was dead. Let us now turn to Sargon's son, Sennacherib. Sennacherib, the father of the great Esarhaddon, ruler of the earth. Sennacherib is the son of a Jewish queen. Listen to this. 2 Kings chapter 19. 2 Kings chapter 19. Assyrian kings had a way of boasting. It was in their blood. It had been for generations. And no one could stop that. Not even King Hezekiah. Let me read a couple of verses to you. 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 8 to 13. The context here now is that King Sennacherib has just been on another military campaign. He has just destroyed the city of Lachish, or Lachish. If you have an interest in history, I'm, I can't show you the pictures today, they're too explicit. But um, they, in the, in the palace of King Sennacherib, there is a mural that goes all the way around the room, floor to ceiling. I think there's like 10 or 12 meters worth of detail after detail. It's a bit like a Where's Wally kind of a cartoon, but it's not a cartoon. It's about how he destroyed Lakish, and it's extremely graphic and very gruesome. I don't recommend it unless you really need to see it. But just having done that to Lakish, Lakish, by the way, is the number two fortress of Judah. That was where the strong soldiers fought. That is where the big walls were. That is where the mighty men of Israel lived. Now, having just defeated them and humiliating them, now Sennacherib knocks on the door of Jerusalem. 2 Kings 19 verse 8. The Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria fighting against Libna, for he had heard that the king had left Lachish. And it goes on to talk here. There's a message which is sent out to Hezekiah and the people of Israel. I've just got the wrong verse here, just a second. I'm going to have to go back a few verses. There's a very proud boast here. I thought it was 8 to 13, but it's not that passage. Verse 10, thank you. Thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah. Do not, this is the boast of the king of Assyria, by the way. Do not let your God, in whom you trust, deceive you by promising that Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands. Keeping in mind the various monument inscriptions, which go into great detail. Devoting them to destruction. And shall you be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them? The nations that my fathers destroyed? We're talking about Tiglath-Pileser, Sargon II. Uh, and he names the lands, the, the land of Gozan, Haran, uh, Rezef, and the people of Edan who are in Telaseh. Where is the king of Hamath? Where is the king of Arpad? 
Where is the king of the city of Sepharvaim? Where is the king of Hena or the king of Ivar? And as the king of Assyria, as Sennacherib makes his boasts, he says, no king on earth has stopped me. No god on earth has stopped me. Who do you think you are, O Israel, to stand in my way? You might as well surrender because your god will be powerless to protect you. Keeping in mind, Sennacherib's mum was who? She was a Jew, Jewess. Who was his grandmother, a great-grandmother, depending upon the... She was also Jewish. There have been great, extended, over generations, cooperation, treaty, uh, yeah, cooperation between Israel and or Judah with Assyria. Hezekiah was the first king to say, this isn't right. We should trust the Lord. We should trust the God of Abraham and Isaac rather than the gods and the kings of the surrounding nations. So now I want to come back to the story that uh, Stephen shared this morning. Jonah chapter, you can say here in uh, 2 Kings, I can just show it on the screen if you like, or if you want to zoom back to Jonah real quickly, I count three prophets that God sent to Nineveh. This is the first one, Jonah chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. The Lord said, you had compassion on the plant which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I, that's the God of the heaven and heavens and earth, should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and their left, as well as many animals? How are we going to make sense of God this morning? We have all these stories of these kings fighting amongst each other, taking advantage of each other, stealing from each other, making fun of each other. And I don't mean that lightheartedly in the worst possible way. Horrific things were happening. Where's God in this picture? What is God's desire for the people of Nineveh? What's God's desire? For the people of Judah and the people of Israel. Let's come back to that violent, proud, arrogant King Esarhaddon, the king of Assyria, the king of Babylon, the king of the four rims, the king of the earth, as he claimed himself to be. Let's have a look now at this king who would dare defy Esarhaddon. Who would it be? Which pitiful king would dare cross the great Esarhaddon? It was Manasseh. We talked about him this morning in the Sabbath school lesson. And here's what I can share with you about the life of Manasseh this morning. He is in 2 Kings as well as in 2 Chronicles, a bit of a, a double record of Israel's history. I'll just share with you from the Chronicles version this part of Manasseh's story. 2 Chronicles 33. Manasseh led Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem astray to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the people of Israel. Similarly, another source outside the Bible says the same thing. If I can get it to come up here. This is the historian Josephus, who lived about the time of Christ. And this is what Josephus says about the, the, the reign of King Manasseh. He says here, he, that's Manasseh, showed himself in his manners most wicked in all respects and omitted no sort of impiety. That means he was pretty happy to do anything. <laughs> uh, but imitated those transgressions of the Israelites by the commission of which against God they had been destroyed. So now King Manasseh is doing the very things that God had asked other people not to do and had, that had their consequences as a result of their bad choices. 
it says here he barbarously slew all the righteous men that would include women and children by the way that were among the hebrews nor would he spare the prophets for every day he slew some of them till jerusalem was getting really messy and we have good reason to suspect that quite likely some of the prophets that you and i know in the bible uh, possibly even isaiah came to grief at the hand of manasseh i have a bit of, bit of conjecture there happy to be corrected on that i didn't get a chance to research that properly this king was a bad king manasseh put his hand out in front of his face nope he couldn't see even a glimpse in the gloomy darkness he reached out and he ran his palm against a hard stone wall the chains on his wrists clanked against the solid surface so permanent so unyielding manasseh let out a long slow breath yes he was still alive but oh how he preferred to be dead who would call this living when would his next shameful public exhibition begin his mind replayed the scenes of the last few days the enemy soldiers ambushing him their rough jostling threats the chains clinked into place on his wrists and ankles the fish hooks inserted into his tender skin being wrenched away from his palace his servants and his guards to face an enemy in shame shame that is what he felt as Esa Harden looked down on him how many times had King Manasseh himself done this very thing to other people to Isaiah perhaps the prophet that God, that God had sent to warn him to other prophets to the followers of God how many noble and upright people had Manasseh treated like this shame torture and murder that is what Manasseh had done for so many people and now it was his turn Manasseh didn't remember much from the first few days after his capture the Assyrians had taken him to their country that'll be Nineveh and thrown him into a dungeon their day and night blurred into one long darkness a darkness darker than anything he had known was even possible the only thing Manasseh had left was time too much of it time to think time to remember Manasseh thought back of all the choices he had made the terrible things he had done who by the way was Manasseh's dad who had been, who had taught Manasseh growing up the good king Hezekiah Manasseh the son of Hezekiah the God the generally godly king he wasn't perfect Hezekiah wasn't perfect but Manasseh was born to Hezekiah in fact Hezekiah Hezekiah sired Manasseh about three years after the son went back when uh, Hezekiah asked the Lord for extension of life God said all right three years later um, Manasseh was born Hezekiah had talked about a God of love a God of grace and patience but what is love what is love in the Assyrian context what is love in the context of a messed up people of Judah what is love in the context of the people of Israel after all they'd done to each other Manasseh's own name itself is interesting Manasseh's name means causing or caused to forget Manasseh had forgotten the ways of his father 
I would suggest perhaps by choice even. But God had not forgotten Manasseh. God had not forgotten Esarhaddon. God had not forgotten Sargon II. And no, God had not even forgotten Tiglath-Pileser III. God cares about all of these people. And God did some pretty amazing things to try and rescue them. I'll just briefly draw your attention to the prophet Nahum in the Bible. We haven't got a time to read through. The time is running out. The book of Nahum is a prophet of God's people writing a letter to who? To Nineveh. This book, this Bible, has three prophets, two of whom are dedicated to the Ninevites. Jonah, Nahum, and possibly also um, aspects of Zephaniah. Not counting all of the other oracles of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, but these other prophets were specifically asked by God to encourage Nineveh to turn back to God. They knew God. These Jewish queens in Assyria were not coincidental. It wasn't like they were just heathens and atheists. They actually had a long-term connection. They remembered back to the time of Abraham, to the time of Isaac. But they had forgotten. I'd like to just draw your attention in closing to the prayer of Manasseh. Now, for those of you that are purists, this prayer is not in the Bible. This is what we call um, a, a pseudopigrapha. It's, it's, it's attributed, but we're pretty sure it wasn't him. It was written way later. It's probably somebody else who wrote this passage. But nevertheless, I think it probably reflects the kind of things that we could imagine Manasseh would have been thinking as he turned back to God. The Bible tells us that Manasseh did indeed turn back to God. This is what it says. This is the prayer of Manasseh. If I can just push my button here. Yep, cool. This is the prayer of Manasseh, uh, 12 and 13. I have sinned, O Lord, I have sinned. I know my transgressions. I earnestly beseech, or I beg you, beg thee, forgive me, O Lord, forgive me. Do not destroy me with my transgressions. Do not be angry with me forever, or lay up evil for me. Do not condemn me to the depths of the earth, for thou, O Lord, art the God of those who repent. And in me thou wilt manifest thy goodness, for unworthy as I am, thou wilt save me in thy great mercy. I will praise thee continually all the days of my life. For all the host of heaven sings your praise, and thine is the glory forever. Amen. We're not quite sure exactly when this happened, but a short time in this area, Esarhaddon passes away, and Manasseh somehow gets back to Jerusalem. Esarhaddon, the great king of Assyria, like his boastful predecessors, met a premature demise, and the wicked king of Judah was reinstated, a bit like Nebuchadnezzar. Fifty more years would elapse before Nineveh would be destroyed. Fifty years of warning for Nahum, for Zephaniah, and for the other prophets to remind the wonderful people of Nineveh that the God of Israel is also the God of Nineveh. Oh, I went too far. Even though these kings, Tiglath-Pileser III, Sargon II, Sennacherib, and Esarhaddon claim to be ruler of the heaven and the earth, there is only one who is the ruler of the heaven and the earth. This God is a God of all nations throughout the book of Isaiah and Ezekiel, it tells us. And this God is anxious to save anybody that would be interested. We read this morning Micah 7, the last three verses in the book of Micah. Who is a God like God who forgives iniquity? And it goes on to talk about the generations of forgiveness 
and the short-term consequences. But I'd also like to draw your attention to a parallel passage to the Micah passage, a passage in Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 18, and this would be my closing passage. Ezekiel chapter 18. In Ezekiel chapter 18, there's a question about whether God is a God of fairness. Is God kind? Is God just? Is God reasonable with people? Or does God show favoritism? Does God sort of do things for his own um, devices? Ezekiel chapter 18 is talking about what God does when people are having a bad day and what God does when people are having a good day. I'm going to just turn here with my, uh, my notes because I didn't have it up. Ezekiel 18 towards the end of the chapter. Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 23, and verse, the last verse in chapter, verse 32. This is what God says. This is in the context of talking about the people who have done wrong in the land of Israel. But throughout the book of Ezekiel, it's clear this is for all nations. Seven nations are mentioned explicitly in this book. 18 verse 23. God says, do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord, rather that he or she should turn from his way and live. Verse 32, for I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord. Therefore, repent and live. Maybe you've had a really tough go in life Maybe you're like these victims in Nineveh. We know from the stories what it was like if you were not the upper crust in Nineveh. It was pretty bad. Maybe you're a victim of circumstances or cruel people. Maybe you're in Nineveh wondering, is there any hope? Is there any way that I'm, I can have a fair go? And I want to encourage you this morning that God sent multiple prophets from another country to Nineveh. At times, Nineveh turned. When Jonah came, Nineveh repented, and they had a good go for a few years. But human characteristics as they are, it's easy for us to forget. Manasseh forgot, but God remembered. If you're pretty confident this morning and think you're on top of the world, I invite you with sincere humility to remember the boasts of these kings. Nebuchadnezzar himself, we didn't look at him this morning, but on every brick he created is stamped his name. That's my brick. Is not this the great Babylon that I have built? Only God builds a kingdom that lasts forever. Only God will treat us with kindness and fairness. Only God, that God of Micah 7 verse 18 and 20, that's the God that I want to revere this morning. Our closing hymn is going to remind us of God's kindness toward us. It's uh, number 109. I encourage you to think as you sing. Let's stand together and share the courage of these verses. This God who saves even the Ninevites, even the people of Judah, even the people of Israel. Dear Lord God Almighty, ruler of the heavens and earth, the one who sits on the throne, surrounded by the four creatures with six wings and infinite eyes, the God who speaks the world into existence, the God who knows the details of every single hair or lack thereof on our head. We are just completely amazed that you care about us, even me kind of us, even the kind of us that is represented in the stories this morning of Esarhaddon, of Manasseh, of Sennacherib, of Tiglath-Pileser, and unfortunately of all too many other uh, people in our past and in our present. Lord, 
Please forgive us individually. Please forgive us corporately. Help us to look to you today. This week here in Maryborough, Lord, and in Harvey Bay and the surrounds, we need your presence. This coming Monday, we have a whole bunch of kids coming to this premises, ostensibly for fun and games and crafts. But Lord, we pray for more than that. I pray that the children who come on Monday and the parents or guardians or those that are involved, may they also see the God of Esarhaddon, not the God that he was initially thinking of, but the God of Abraham and Isaac, of Jacob and Ishmael, the God that gives people second chances, nay, even 70 times seven extra chances. Please, Lord, be merciful to us today and help us in turn to be kind and merciful to those around us. Please help us to deal with the hurt and pain in our lives so that your name will be glorified, so that those hooks and chains that psychologically or even physically hurt us may be removed, that we may be free sons and daughters of God. That's our earnest prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.